Good morning, Jim here, AK Whiskey Philosopher, and today you're gonna have a travel story. The time that I got attacked by Tibetan Mastiffs in Tibet. Stay tuned. Today I'm coming to you from lovely Kanagawa, Japan. I'm sitting next to the Sagami River, the Sagamigawa as it's known, and I'm here early in the morning. What a beautiful day. I've got ducks, I've got cormorants hunting fish, got a waterfall with some trout jumping down there. It's just a fantastic morning. Now the story today is a continuation. The last story, which was about fate saving me from being burnt in a tent fire in Tibet. That's a very, very memorable incident in my life. This one is also pretty memorable as well. So in the last video, after the tent fire, we came down off of that high pass. That pass was 5,000 meters, very unpleasant. We came down and we were going to Kailash. And Kailash, if you remember, was a religious pilgrimage for Tibetan Buddhists, where they circle around, walking around a very, very difficult journey because it, you're already at altitude. The town's name next to Kailash was named Darchen. I think that was 5,000 meters. So just walking on flat ground is difficult. It feels like you're running a race, right? You really have to slow yourself down. As I mentioned in the last video, uh, normal human beings would usually take, I think, two and a half days or so to circle the, uh, this thing. Usually you would stay somewhere in a tent or, or we had another plan that I'll tell you about. Darchen is a nothing town. It's just a bunch of tents. It's nothing. They have like these tents that are stores and they'll sell uh, freeze-dried noodles and maybe some, some cookies if you're lucky. And a lot of Tibetan mastiffs. These things, they come in black or red or brown and they look a lot like a Newfoundland, right? Like a huge Snuffleupagus woolly mammoth beast in, this, in the really big cities, which I didn't go to any big cities, but Lhasa, I mean, you might, you might see some nice dressy mastiffs, right? Combed and groomed and looking good, but the only mastiffs I saw out in the wilderness, out in the wild, out in the outback, just look like hungry, snarling beasts all the time. And the only ones I saw, they were either wild or half wild. Because even if you own a dog out there, I mean, most of these people don't seem to have enough food for themselves. So <laughs> certainly it's tough to feed your dog enough if you don't have enough food for yourself. I was always hungry. I was always looking for food. It's just not a lot of food. So every time I saw one of these things, they're, they're, they just look like they want to eat you, right? And they're acting like that as well. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of do these dogs in Darchan and around Kailash. That's an aside. Handy information for later. Aaron and I, we start off on our trek. We're gonna do our overnight. We had read in the Tibet travel manual that halfway through that, through that travel, you can stay for free at this Tibetan monastery that's uh, in such and such a location. And we thought, yeah, that's the indigenous experience. So I was, I was you know, my dances with wolves moment. So we, we search out and we find this, this monastery. Jeez, I, I, we really had a tough time finding this monastery. I'm going back and forth. Where is this thing supposed to be? And finally I found out it was like cloaked into the mountain. This thing is like, you know, it's hardly visible because it's, it's made of rocks and it's on rocks. So it was not nearly as big as I thought it would be. So we go there, knock on the door. And how, how do you think this went? You have a couple, couple foreigners coming out of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, knocking on your door saying, hey, I read in a book that I could stay at your place for free. <laughs> That's pretty much how it went. They just looked at us. They looked, two guys, they looked at each other. They looked at us like, huh? And of course, there was a language barrier also. Yeah, it turned out that was not the normal thing, but they were very kind. They let us stay in a, in a room. There weren't, you know, it's only like three or four rooms. In, in total and they gave us a room and the room had like a half a roof it was really cold and it snowed that night we got snowed on it was it's pretty miserable as i mentioned for tibetan buddhists this is a must do pilgrimage before we went to bed i had you know in my mind well you know it's cold let's build a fire you know i i had researched you know how you could burn yak yak shit <laughs> to to make a fire so I was going all over, I was, I was collecting all this yak shit, and, and then I got back to the monastery and everybody's laughing at me, it's like, it's too wet to burn, you got fresh poo, you need old, old crap. Didn't work out. And then that night they gave us some sampa, which is the powdered, some sort of a powdered grain with yak butter tea, and you know, as much as I really wanted, it's an indigenous meal, I really wanted to like it. Just couldn't do it, man. Just wasn't good at all. As I mentioned, we were on the same trail with this student group that I mentioned in the last video. 40 to 60 kids, university kids, in a fantastic program from back in the state. They were studying about Buddhism 
I think, and the Himalayas and culture. And then they came here for India, Nepal, Tibet for a semester or two to travel all these significant Buddhist sites. And one of them was Kailash, which is a must-do site for Tibetan Buddhists. As I mentioned, this site was supposed to be where Milarepa, who I think brought Buddhism from India to Tibet, and he was a kind of a magical figure, and the leader of the indigenous religion. The religion, I think, was called Bumpo after the leader, I believe, also called Bumpo. Also a magical figure. Well, these two figures had a magical Avengers X-Men battle on this mountain, and they're supposed to be all different artifacts of this battle. In fact, the crack that, that comes down the mountain is supposed to be a result of this battle. So, 40 to 60 kids on the trail, I wanted to avoid this. So we had an idea to wake up early and get on the trail before these kids. Because if you've ever seen, especially where trails start to get steep, you've probably seen trail, uh, pictures of like Everest or other, like once you get to the peak, it could actually be a line of people waiting because it's really, really tough going. So we decided to wake up as early as possible. We woke up in the morning, gosh, probably about 4 a.m. and went out into this amazing moonscape. It was like being on another world. There was, there was a bit of moon. Well, I don't think it was a full moon. It was a bit of moon out. It's lit up. It's just like this Martian landscape, shadows everywhere, howling Tibetan mastiffs in every shadow. <laughs> That's, I, I didn't see any of them. You could just hear them out there waiting for you to come. We, we get out on the trail, freezing cold. I, I had originally a flashlight and a backup, and I gave my backup to Aaron, who, who a few days before, because he had lost his flashlight or something. So I had a flashlight, Aaron had a flashlight, we go out, we're leading with my flashlight, and mind you, mo a lot of the stuff that I have were, were copies, very cheap copies that we had bought somewhere like in Kathmandu or maybe in Lhasa. You know, you buy these cheap, cheap copies of U.S. goods that are, you're just, it shouldn't be essential equipment that you buy your copies with. On the trail, 4 a.m., just a little bit of moonlight, following the trail, using my flashlight, and then... <laughs> I think, I think mine, it was a cheap copy of a mag light is what it was, I twist on and off. Well, without warning, I'm going on the trail and suddenly my, my mag light just like it pukes its guts. I didn't know a flashlight could do that. And everything came out of it, you know, the, the lens, the cap, the contact, the screw, the, the batteries, and like, you know, these little bits and stuff. And I was like, good grief in the darkness. So I'm down there on my hands and knees trying to pick up the guts of my flashlight. I couldn't find all the parts. And I said, Aaron, bring over that flashlight I gave you and let, let's, you know, find, let's find the parts. I said, oh, I lost that days ago. <laughs> I was like, what? Are you serious? So yeah, 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 I lost that. I was really angry, actually. I was really angry because I was afraid of what might happen, what was, was what was about to happen. <laughs> so we had no light. We're on this trail. At the moment, the trail is kind of obvious, right? It's a different color from the, like the surrounding ground is more brown and the trail is like more whitish because it's beaten. Got a little bit of moonlight. Figure out, you know, the sun will be coming up in an hour or, or more. So we had this choice. Well, what do we do? We, we go back, we wait here, or we press on. Obviously, the smart thing would have been to, to wait or go back. So of course, we pressed on. So we're going, we're going, we're going. The trail becomes less obvious. And we start to have to make some choices. And probably we made some bad choices. We were on the wrong trail. And how we knew that for sure was at one point, the sun was up. The sun had been up for maybe half an hour. I could hear the students. I could hear their echoes of all their voices. And it wasn't, it wasn't where we were. It was, I could see it was like outside like we were going in a circle, but it was in another circle. It was kind of outside our circle. And there was like a mountain between us and them, not a mountain that you could climb over. And I could hear their happy voices <laughs> laughing and on the trail. And I was just thinking, oh man, I hope, I hope this doesn't turn out badly. So we continue on. We have no choice. We're hours into this hike by now. So we're going and we're, we're making choices and we're, so the trail is, is forcing us into a, a certain path. And then that path got really, really dark, dark in a bad kind of way. And what happened was we we're kind of hit with what turned into an ice wall, ice and rocks. And it was kind of evil in a way because 
it started out like it was so big and so long you couldn't you really couldn't appreciate how steep it was like for the last one third and it just kind of sucked you in and it's kind of like what I talked about in the last video you never imagine like you're, you see someone or someone in a really bad position and you say how the heck did they get there it's one step at a time <laughs> one step at a time and that's what happened so I don't have any special gear we're climbing up snow and ice and it turns into a wall was punctuated by rocks and you're kicking your legs in kicking your feet in kicking your toes in it's really hurting your toes kicking your hands in now as an aside especially at altitude you have good days and you have bad days and these bad stretches of days sometimes you know you have a good few days a bad few days i was having a bad few days you're always sick right you always you always got some kind of a bug in your intestines or whatnot you know something you ate or drank or you know that that's always going on but i was having a bad altitude day altitude is affecting me i was not breathing well i was about 50 percent of even my reduced usual and Aaron was having a good day <laughs> 18 year old bulletproof little Canadian having a good day and that that was wearing on my mind so down the trail he was all hippity hoppity and I was the tortoise in the back but not the good kind of tortoise <laughs> we're on this ice wall and Aaron is kind of boop, 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 and I'm getting bogged down and then I, I come to a really really dark point and I I'm up the, the wall is just about vertical now. I've probably got another 40, 50 meters to go. I can't feel my fingers. I can't feel my toes. I'm looking back down. There's just like this big ice slide with jagged rocks here and there. It's just, you know, certain dismemberment if you slide back down. And I had, I had a dark moment, man. I just put my face against the ice and I was feeling like low. I don't think I could do this. I don't think I could go any further. I don't know what to do. Can't go down, can't go up. <laughs> and I, you know, I hit this dark moment. And I don't know what turned around, but I was just like, Wah! I got a, a surge of energy. And what I decided to do was make my way sideways where there were more rocks and maybe more sure footing. And I kick, 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 kick. And I was breaking through the ice. I didn't care if I couldn't feel my toes or my hands. Broke over, broke over, broke over. Hit more of the rocks and I was able to slowly scramble my way up to meet Aaron at the top well get up to the top at the top of that this was a pass and how we knew was there were Tibetan flags up there and Tibetans will mark passes with these with these flags and when you get up there it's like oh it's like being at the end of a marathon crossing that rhythm you knew you've reached your spot and but it was kind of strange so now when I reached this I said hold on we're at a pass clearly but I looked in the snow, there's zero footprints around here. And it's not new snow. I was like, what is going on? I hear the voices still, they're not here. Clearly they're going a different way, but we're on a pass. Is this the pass? I have no idea. So I said, all right, anyway, a pass, we've done it. We're looking down, I could see the trail or the direction to the trail on the way back. So it's kind of a glide path from here. We're working down. We do have a few choices to make, there's no drama. We get down to the trail, we're so damn happy. Uh, now we just need to look for some food. There are some spots that we could have stopped along the way and I decided not to. Aaron also decided not to. One of them was kind of cool, a little bit of regret. So there was a cave where it was supposed to be a small cave and Milarepa went in there and stretched the cave ceiling up and there are handprints in the stone where he stretched the cave up. So. I might have wanted to see that. Got back to Darchan. The next day, went into the market. We were starting to think about the trail back. Uh, we were going to have to hitch a ride, hopefully with the people that we came with, but that was no guarantee. So we were looking for ride possibilities. There were some other expeditions we had to check with. And we need some food. Staple food in the Himalayas for me were packets of ramen noodles. And usually I would eat them dry. They were beautiful because they were light. They were packable. You didn't care if they broke. You didn't really need to cook them. They lasted a long time. They were like the ideal food, aside from health issues. But I was a young man, what did I care? I think I was 30 at that point. So we went around and it was very scarce. We couldn't, we couldn't find very many places that had them. And the places that did, it was very expensive. So we're kind of going tent to tent negotiating. Well, in the midst of walking down this little tent, tent village of Darchen, I was walking down the main stretch and a couple nasty, mangy, gnarly black mastiffs came 
right came up and like like a couple of jet fighters along my right and kind of distracted me off to the right and they were not looking good man they were they were looking you know attacky and my attention was fully with them well while my attention was with them another one grabbed me from the back left this was a group hunt <laughs> this was a coordinated hunt grabbed my pant leg and started trying to drag me to the ground and Aaron thankfully was keeping the other two away they were, they were trying to attack him. Luckily, they weren't all on me. I would have been gone. I was grabbing my pant leg, and I was trying to maneuver, maneuver, maneuver. I was trying not to get bit. Finally, it got me, and it bit into my leg pretty good. And then I picked up a big rock, and Aaron picked up rocks as well, and picked up the rocks, and they, and they split. By the way, the owners of these dogs were all watching. <laughs> were all watching from their tents like, huh, look at that. Yeah, I guess a dog gets to eat today weird so I'm so I'm bit pretty good however you know you bit by a giant mastiff at Kailash in Tibet I mean you know for a little while it was a good story but that wore off really quickly because I met a doctor uh, in in town he was he was a foreigner on another expedition and dude, my pant leg is all ripped up and he's like hey what's what is that I explained and he says oh gosh uh, ooh, you might you might be worried about rabies I said what are you talking about he says yeah a lot of these a lot of the, the mammals out, out here have rabies and, you know, you really should get that shot as soon as possible. And it's like, well, isn't the nearest hospital like a week away in the wilderness? He said, yeah. And he tells me, you know, the symptoms I should look for and, and stuff like that. And, and so every day goes, you know, back, it was another week back to Nepal and, and land cruisers. That's another story. But every day I was like, my mind was just screwing with me i was thinking am i more irritable today is is am i am i snapping at Aaron more is you know is the road getting to me more than usual yeah i was definitely not not in a good mood for for a couple weeks after that i was wondering if if i had rabies or not as an aside later on what we found out the pass that Aaron and i accidentally found was uh or forbidden pass and it was only supposed to be used by people who had already gone around Mount Kailash a certain number of times, maybe 13, but you had to earn that pass, otherwise it was forbidden. And that's why there weren't a lot of footprints up there. And someone had kind of said, ah, I wonder if that's why you were attacked by Mastiffs as a, uh, a payback for taking the forbidden pass. So, one never knows. <laughs> but if you ever get into Tibet, my strong advice, beware of Tibetan Mastiffs. They're really bad, and I've had even some, I've heard of some much worse encounters. So I hope you enjoyed that story. Being attacked by wild Tibetan Mastiffs after going over a forbidden pass, it doesn't get much better than that. It's much better as a story than, than being there when it happened. If you'd like to hear more stories like this and other kind of stuff, please uh, subscribe, join in. Until then, I will see you down the road.